we also have to keep in mind, I agree that there's going to be a second wave of this at some point, uh, and we're not fully prepared because we don't have vaccines and things of that nature and, and testing and I won't even go into all that. But if you got to think about it as an institution, the institution is also uh, an employer. Um, in large, a lot of times we are the largest employers or one of in many of our regions, our cities and areas. And so if we can't open in the fall semester, uh, again, this is going to sound bad. Um, so it's almost saying like some people are going to have to get sick, but students staying home, faculty, staff, everybody staying home, missing that big paycheck, missing the university paycheck. Some universities would not be able to survive from this. It, it's not as easy as just saying that, you know, there's going to be a second wave, we should shelter in place. I'm not saying you all are saying that, but I'm saying that some people are, are saying that or um, so. But Eric, can I ask you a question? It's a tough situation because you do have to open it at some level. But Eric, uh, let me ask you a quick question before you move forward. Before you move forward, I'm going to ask you a quick question. It's the same one I would ask any university president who's standing up in front of their, their teams. And you're saying the same kinds of things. I'm not saying that these aren't real considerations. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me who of your family you would serve up so that we can open up in the fall? Who would you give us <laughs> that we can open? Who would serve up? Who would you give up? Who would you give up on the altar of opening the university? I mean, I would, I would just go in. I mean, I would take precautions and, and do what I got to do. So that, I'm glad you said that because I went and got a prop while I went off camera. <laughs> you know how hard you it is? One. You know, I have 20. Because I, I order early in the morning. Man. The but do you know how hard it is to find Lysol as an individual? Do you know yeah. that the supply chain is broken? Tell me how much cleaning material you all have at the University of Memphis to, and how much PPE you have for the custodial staff to make sure that your campus can open in the fall. Can you tell me that? I can. So what I'm saying is when we run to the ec economic impacts of this, we are missing the reality of this. And I'm not a medical doctor, so I want to get the medical doctor in, but we got to have very <laughs> different kinds of conversations. <laughs> you all don't have Lysol at home. Some of y'all don't have toilet paper. No, he, he's, he's hitting home to some. He's hitting home to some. We were just in a meeting today preparing for the fall and having to order PPE and, and equipment and realize we won't have enough. Right, because it's back order, supply chain doesn't can't meet the demands or anything like that. And now you have employees, somebody even like myself who's immunosuppressant, concerned because you're telling me now that I won't have the proper needs I have to even step foot on campus to make sure I don't end up. So that's a great question. And this is no shade to Dr. Borrego, but um, how old are your average faculty and administrators at a university? <laughs> <laughs> Almost all of them are going to be in the sensitive category. And I'm going to tell you right now, if I was an old man at a university, you could not get me to come into a classroom with a bunch of COVID-breathing 18-year-olds who will not follow social distancing requirements. Going back to it, so, the, and this is the frustration on the, the world that I'm living in right now, is the concept of emergency remote teaching is a concept that is being pushed by those of us that have a PhD in online instruction, right? But we're a very small minority in the greater the greater uh, scheme of things. So what's happening is you have um, publications that are not peer reviewed, such as the Chronicle of Higher Education, <laughs> Inside Higher Education, that are pushing out these um, statements that are being written by people who are not PhDs in online instruction. Um, and and this is not slanderous. Like you can look up who's writing the articles they do not have a background in online teaching or learning. And in fact, I have colleagues that have tried to write rebuttal pieces to say, that's not what the research shows, you're, you're spreading bad information, and Chronicle and Inside Higher Education will not publish them. And what's happening is the only, play, only avenue that we have to publish is avenues that we're already using. So for instance, the, the readership of Chronicles of Higher Education is huge compared to Educause Review, right? Mm -hmm. So Educause Review is the one that will publish about the emergency remote teaching and explain what the difference is and make sure that people, even though instruction has moved online, teaching has not moved online, right? Because we haven't gotten to that point yet. So there are still people who are calling what's happening right now online teaching. And, and we have been in our field have been like, no, this is not, this is not what, when, when I, I had a conversation with my uncle, that people know what I do, like in my family, and they say, oh, how's online teaching going for you? I said, I've been teaching online the entire year, because my class is already online, right? 
but what I'm doing is not what these other students are doing and these other teachers are doing. And that's what the problem is, is that now everything has been lumped in together and there's not enough differentiation. And since there's not enough differentiation, it's, gonna, it's hard to know what those impacts are gonna be. But there are, when, when, we, when we look at, so for instance, when I get an email from the president of my university, it does not say, thank you for your emergency remote teaching. It does not use that phrasing. It says, thank you for teaching online. Thank you for moving your instruction to online. Like, because it, it, the, the powers that be, I mean, there was a, a, a comment about uh, Sue, uh, 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 how old the administrators are, but there's also a disconnect between the front line and, and, and the administrators. Because the administrators don't always understand that administrators are not reading the, the literature, right? I could give you, I can write you an article right now on best practices for online discussion forums, but who has time to read that? Because everyone's scrambling trying to fi figure that out. You, anyone who's taught knows you can't create a sense of community in three days, right? If, if you had a certain sense of community for your face-to-face your -face class, you can't suddenly go and put something up online because you can't change. I mean, we wouldn't do that to our students. We wouldn't change our syllabus. Um, I mean, I, I ran into an issue where I actually feel that maybe uh, my grades were a little bit off because I made adjustments to my syllabus and I, and I realized after I did my grades, I said, wait a second, I probably should have changed the point values for that because when I changed that requirement, I changed the way that assignment was actually done. But I was moving so quickly, I didn't even think you know, that should have been, that should be worth 10 points instead of 20 points, right? So, so the students got the benefit of that, but that's even with me being already online. So I can only imagine what's happening with the other students. We've had a lot of issues with pass fail. There's huge implications for pass fail classes as it relates to uh, accreditation, um, as it relates to, uh, particularly with our K-12, and I'm, I'm hypersensitive because I work in education. So with the K-12, we have some huge issues with students taking pass fail on, on classes. We have an issue where is it, it probably, what's going to happen in the conversation we had was what's going to happen in three years from now? What's going to happen to that first year student who is enrolled in some type of prerequisite class as part of their education major? What's going to happen in three years when they're going up for a, uh, getting their uh, licensure and they're submitting their paperwork for licensure? And the, the licensure is expecting that, that the rule is in order to be a, a you, you had to get a B in this class, right? Now they see there's a P, right? Well, the, the, that means they technically could have gotten a C in the class and still gotten a P, right? So now all of a sudden you have accreditation issues now. Now you have students who may essentially be told in three years, we can't give you a teacher license because you actually don't meet the requirements because it, in order to make those requirements change, it takes an administrative, a literal act of Congress, and what's gonna happen? So how, we get, how do we advise students today for what's gonna happen three years from now when we don't even know what's gonna happen three years from now? Okay, I wanna move us forward. I'm gonna, so I want us to move forward in how do we address this? How do we bounce back? So I wrote a series of questions that I just wanna read out to the entourage and people can respond as the spirit moves them. So I wrote some moving forward questions that I'd like for us to consider and discuss as it moves us. The questions are, I'm gonna read them out. How will institutions bounce back? Um, what does this mean for tuition moving forward? Will there be long-term financial effects in higher ed? Uh, what are the implications for higher education policy? How can we be more prepared for the next phase? I think we've really honed in on that. Um, and then the final one is what should stakeholders, really parents and students expect moving forward? How should they prepare for the fall? So if anybody wants to respond to any of those questions as we try to move this conversation forward, you, you know, I, I want to talk about bouncing back. I'm not sure it's a bounce. It might be a roll. <laughs> you know, in the water crisis, in the Flint water crisis, um, there's still a hangover, right? It, that is still in the public and it's still online. You can't have a community that has 63% uh, minority community and, and lie to it about being poisoned, right? So I had that rhetoric going on 
and I was on the hospital board to know what was actually going on. And what I would say is, you, yeah, we, you have to think constantly about communication because I, there was no way to create a counter narrative. Once one child has elevated lead, I would be an ass if I created a counter narrative. We had to create a parallel narrative that said, the universities here, were, this is our role in the community. This is our role for students. How do we fund differently? I lost $10.5 million in three years. And I had to fight, I had to, I had to fight some on my own campus about the fact that this was the time to increase financial aid, right? This was the time, and it, when everybody's hanging on by their nails, you know, those are hard conversations to have. And I would say, I, I, I think a second piece of rolling back is that we have got to quit dismissing the students in our communities that we've written off. In Flint, the story is, oh, all of these elementary kids, they don't know about college. When I go read to first graders, how many of you know about University of Michigan Flint? They raise their hand. How many know about Michigan State? They raise their hand. We aren't courting those students. And so I think my dream job, if I had the money to just do this, would be to start with four and five-year-olds. There are programs across the country, there are programs in every city, really nice, pretty beads in a box. So somebody's working with five-year-olds, somebody's working with eight-year-olds, somebody's working with 11-year-olds. What we're not doing is, we're not pulling the thread of degree pathway of college going culture, we're hitting you at five years and saying, yeah, you can do this and then we don't talk to you again. So if anything, one of my best hopes would be that we use this time. When I was in California, I met, I got, uh, I think it was nine or 11 of the community colleges and said, look, not enough of our students are going to college to fight over where they go, right? So let's partner and reach out to those students in high school and say, here's the way people go to school. Some go two years, some go four years, and start to market and work together. Um, whoever made the comment on degree pathways, there's nothing that makes me wanna stick a knife in my eyes more than degree pathways because like I had, I'm losing 100 students a year in a criminal justice degree because my faculty thinks we have a more philosophical approach and the community college has a practical approach, so we're not gonna create pathways. So I guess for me in the, in the bounce or the roll forward, it's that we have got to look at uh, better business practices around getting and keeping students who are our students. I, I would just echo to say that we, this is the time for higher education to take a new look at itself. Uh, and if we go back to the normal practices, which my gut tells me some schools will, uh, and some schools will actually take this time to really deep dive into how they need to come out on the uh, different on the other end. Um, but what scares me is that the whole idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion would definitely lose out in this time frame, specifically when you talk about equity and equity of resources, right? So I think a lot of that will fall to the forefront. Uh, specifically when we got to get in these boardrooms and make budget decisions. Uh, I know as an institution, they've told us how much we've lost already, just some refunds from this semester, what we look like if we go into the fall and we don't open back up what we lose uh, financially. Um, being at the University of Akron and being on the board there, uh, understanding those dynamics, but I think things like that there are still a, should be a top priority will fall to the wayside, and I, I really think diversity, equity, inclusion will take a real push back, in my opinion, at predominantly white institutions anyways, uh, from that perspective, even when it comes to enrollment, even when it comes to uh, recruitment of faculty, um, across the board overall from that perspective. And so it's very unique for us um, having this conversation today because I am looking, uh, as I look at higher education leadership, or who are the true leaders or who are the true institutions that were truly where the values that we always say we have and we put out on our websites uh, moving forward and truly stick to those, even though it will cost them some money, right? Because that's what it's gonna boil down to. I keep telling people, higher education is still a business um, from that perspective. And like the good doctor said, 
hey, you get out of ICU and 10 days later, you still got to go to work in some regards. It is a business. Uh, and we have to understand that. And in that regard, you have to understand that business also impacts a community. Uh, I know of Chapel Hill was the, the sufferer, as Dr. Moore talked about. Chapel Hill's got employees, almost 30,000 people. You know, so you think about it. I'm here with a lot of the colleagues that live next door to me and everything like that to work for Duke or Chapel in, in this area. And for those institutions to be anchors in this community, the financial impact is huge. And these are high paying jobs. Right. Because also I think about the research. I'm at our top tier research institution. How will research play out? Uh, because I think that's important for us to have a conversation around as well, because at my school, they're like, look, we're ready to go back to the labs. We're ready to get this going. We don't care about safety, basically, um, from that perspective. We need to get this grant money. I'm a PI on this and I'm doing that. And so our students are thinking about that. But on the faculty side, hey, they're looking like, look, I still want to get back to my research and do everything from that particular reason. So I would hope um, as a solution that leaders truly take this time, as Kadish has mentioned, and really plan for 2021, but beyond. Matter of fact, you might need to go back to your strategic plan or your next four year plan, scrap it and really sit down and go through it and say, you know what, this is what we thought. But now that this is thrown a, a definitely a monkey wrench on our system, we need to really think about this and how does this look for our students, our faculty, our staff, our community as a whole. I just did a strategic plan when I was at North Carolina Central University. I know when I look at their plan now as being a, a, a key person working on that plan, a lot of that needs to go back right now. And they need to pull out some bullet points like this ain't gonna work, this ain't gonna work, this is not going to happen from there and so again a lot of us really i pray and hope that a lot of true leaders do not go back to the normal way that they really think through this process that they really think at all levels and they include people uh, i know we get in these boardrooms and we get in these cabinet meetings i've been sitting on a cabinet and we make these decisions we're not really truly thinking about it and all we're thinking about one is the dollar but truly how it's going to impact us because here's the kicker in the head Anybody that's sitting on that cabinet right now, they can walk out the door with, uh, you know, a, a golden parachute. They can walk out the door with certain things, but it's the person that's the administrative secretary over in one office making $40,000 a year that you really got to think about, or the first generation student who really their whole family don't put their house up and mortgage it for them to go to college. And these are the decisions we need to make. So I want to, I want to try to wrap this up and I, so I want everyone to respond to this and I'll start out by by answering, but I want us, I want everyone to respond to how will you move forward in your role in higher ed? How will you embrace this new normal as a practitioner, as a professional, as an educator, as a participant? How will you embrace this new normal in higher ed? One of the main things that I do when I have staff is I always tell them. You know, I think one of the greatest skills you can have as a leader is managing and navigating change. And so from the conversation that I'm hearing today, it sounds like the leadership is going to have to put out all of these COVID fires right now, make it to the end of the semester, while simultaneously plan for the fall, plan for next year across multiple functional areas to include faculty, staff, students, community, enrollment, all of this and so it's 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 going to be a lot of multitasking um and so if if people have not been able to learn how to navigate change and manage change and multitask i think we're going to be falling behind the curve um, so that's what i'm going to try to do um as i move forward in my role at unc charlotte i mean they just emailed us and said we're pushing uh the first day of class back two days our first day when we open is going to be labor day or what is it in September? They've already told us we're opening in September. Um, and so my goal again is to try to, you know, na na cultivate my navigating change for now and for later. So, so I, I guess only thing I can do is, um, and I've talked to my students about this, is um, yes, it's important to research COVID, but I have been challenging my students to go to a, diff a different level and not just do that surface research, but start looking more at process and start looking at things that actually can have impactful change. Um, so doing different research than, did you prefer teaching online or what tools were helpful for you? Like, that's not useful. Let's look at what, what, were, way, what were techniques that you did. So really trying to foster research on that regard so that we can uh, make sure people understand how to do that. And then the, the second thing that I can do and I will do 
is continue to focus on my teaching and ensure that the students that graduate from my program, who are ultimately going to be the ones helping other people move online, that they are getting the best instruction possible on how to teach in an online environment, because the online environment is here to stay. I mean, I, I, I saw that coming in, in when I got my PhD. The whole reason why I got my PhD is I said, hey, the, the, the wave of the future is we're moving more online than less online. That's what I thought. All COVID does is accelerated that. So my contribution is I have doctoral students in instructional design. I have master's students in instructional design. So my focus is making sure that my class is done well so they carry that forward when they go back to their institution and we get like that wildfire in a positive way so we can get inform good uh, pedagogy going forward. Thank you, sir. It sounds like you will have job sustainability for a good moment. Uh, I may need to move to a different institution now. <laughs> <laughs> As my parting comments, thank you, uh, Dream Launch, for having me on this amazing panel. You all are, are brilliant people. It's so good to hear um, the experience of all this uh, in different parts of the country at different institutions. Um, for me, I think um, a couple of things. One, the traditional way of going about recruiting students uh, is obviously got to change. Uh, for, primarily, we focus on high school students, freshmen, uh, then transfers, and then it's the hodgepodge of uh, the non-traditional adult students that are in different areas of their life and in different spaces. Um, we'll need to be more intentional. Uh, the University of Memphis does a pretty good job because we do have a pretty high enrollment rate of uh, adult students, and so we, we've got to be more intentional about going after those students uh, as much, with as much passion as we do with uh, freshmen. Uh, we won't be able to probably walk into high schools like we normally do all the time. Uh, so I, we got to think about how do we uh, re-engage students like that. We can't have big recruitment programs uh, where we bring in thousands of students and parents on campus. We might need to rethink those things. So we're working through all those now. It's kind of like you said, uh, we're, we're trying to get through the, this uh, semester as in we're trying to bring in this class. At the same time, trying to take a quick breath and think about um, you know plans for the fall. Uh, Dr. Um, Borrego brought up a good point about communication uh, with uh, enrollment management. Uh, communication is, is critical um, to uh, talk about the good things that your university is doing to prepare um, for the fall semester. Uh, there's probably not a lot of communication because people don't really know um, what to think, what to do. I know we have a committee plan, planning for that. I know some other institutions are probably farther or behind uh, where others are. Um, but as admissions offices, enrollment offices, we've got to be able to communicate that to students to let the, to reassure them uh, uh, about what, how we're going to take care of your babies and how we're going to take care of you know the students and provide high quality uh, online education uh, at times and not emergency management or emergency remote teaching. But I love that term. <laughs> um, so all those things, and then uh, lastly, I'll say um, fighting for staff. I mean, I think that's going to be critical. I got about forty. Um, team members uh, that, that helped me do my job and trying to fight for those positions. Um, thankfully, we're at a good place where our president has, has said that we're not uh, at a point of furloughs or laying people off. We're probably not going to rehire positions, but, uh, you know, if things stay the same, you know, that's great. But if things change and they say, hey, you got to give up four or five positions, you know, those are people's lives and, and they're in your hands to, to, to make those decisions. So it's a tough thing. And, uh, we just all going to pray, pray our way through this. Thank you, Dr. Stokes. 40 staff, mm. Lord help. Right. <laughs> so in, in, on one hand, I have to be honest, I am super glad I do not work on campus at an institution right now. I think these are very difficult decisions. I know I'm giving a lot of you know, sidewalk commentary and thinking about how I engage with our members at EAB, but these are really difficult challenges. And I think to Eric's point, I mean, these are gonna come down to some management by spreadsheet. You're simply gonna have to cut because there's no resources. So when I think about this, I think about it across three different spectrums that higher education is gonna be forced to change on as we leave. And I think the one that we should start with is thinking about how we engage around student success. What is happening for students on our campuses now is even more important than it was when it was face-to-face. -face. It is uncovering a number of challenges around equity, challenges around access, but also just challenges in how we engage students. Now, to Tierney's point, I think there's a balancing act. I think higher ed is an industry. I don't necessarily think it's simply a business, but I think there are some things we can learn from businesses in terms of how they engage with their customers that we can apply to how we engage with students and their families that we, are, we have not for a long time been willing to do, but we were willing to take their resource 
under promise for a good they can use in the marketplace. But we haven't then been willing to apply some of those same benefits and skills to how we engage them. And I think that student success is you talked about investments around diversity, equity, inclusion. We talk about those things like they're a nice to have and not a responsibility for an industry that draws resources from those communities as we continue to grow and build over time. And if we think and project forward to 2025, these are gonna be the populations that are gonna be the only ones we have access to to continue to grow and to be and to thrive as well as the institutions and we can't just ignore them because it's inconvenient to do so right now we have to think about them very differently and it has to be more than rhetoric I think you could dish yeah embrace it embrace it this is an opportunity for us to innovate and embrace and improve uh who's next okay. Dr. Borrego? okay yes. um so as i think about what i do uh, going forward. Uh, I'm with Kaddish. I'm glad I'm not the president this year. Uh, you know, and, it, and this conversation, interestingly, I've been trying to figure out for the last five or six months that I want to be a president again. Because frankly, I don't want to spend the next part of my career arguing with faculty about what we know we need to do on a campus. It's like, oh, we have a problem. Let's go research it. At some point, we have to do. We have to act on what we know. I I'm, I'm a woman of a certain age, Kaddish. <laughs> and, um, and so I've been around the field 30 years. I mean, what Freeman Rabowski did, we were looking at it Caltech in the early 80s, and we're not in very much of a different place. So, so it makes me think, um, you know, this, you guys through your business, uh, through DreamWatch are creating a space for these kinds of conversations. Sometimes I think right now, um, I, to take that full professor appointment and, and, and maybe go part-time now again, I'm not an entrepreneur, you know, I was a poor girl growing up. I want to know where that check's coming from. I don't have the guts to be an entrepreneur, frankly. But I think about I've had a platform for writing and speaking and creating space uh, because, because of, frankly, because I've got white privilege, right? So my whole career, those of you who have worked with me know that I've tried to use that privilege to create space. I think I might have a wider platform of creating space if I wasn't a president because I because either you have to be too careful or when you tell the truth people are like holy hell that came from the president um, and I don't know that I want to I don't know that I want to fight the individual fights anymore I I think I might do something different but so that's what I think about going forward I learned a lot uh, in the crisis and about, I, I wouldn't have guessed that there was still so much to learn about the um, uneven impact of crisis in a community, right? And about how to live wholly in that community as a member of the community with the privilege I have with a consciousness about those that don't have that. At the end of that two year period, I didn't even remember the first year. I mean, I, it was like a blur because the thing that probably drives me and scares me the most is not utilizing my, my space and my privilege to make the widest path or widest space. space. So as you're, it was like what we've all said, as you're navigating the crisis in it, you don't have the time to sit back and go, oh man, did I do this right or did I do this right? So that's that thing of, you know, you practice uh, in the two minute decisions so that when you have one of the hour decisions, you've got good skills at practicing, right? And I think navigating the crisis in this, you know, for any administrator at least, you're in a bubble. I mean, people are watching everything you do. So um, I think that, you know, maybe going forward, I uh, create more space. Yeah. We're going to snap our fingers to more space and yeah. enlarge and enlarge territories for the Christians in the room. Um, you're a Sonia. What say ye? We'd love to hear from you. So I'm in my small corner of the world out in West Texas where the 
tumbleweeds roll across the the highway. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm touchy feely and I'm emotional and I'm all over the place. But I think no matter what position that we're in, no matter what place we're in, that we have, and, and you can call me a silly, um, I don't know what you want to call me, but I think we have to care. In all of these positions of privilege that we have, in all of these positions of um, somewhat power, if the positions that we have in order to speak, to have a platform, we have to care. People are scared, they are sick, they are broke, <laughs> people are dying, people need an education, people need an opportunity, people need higher education, they need us. We must care. We cannot simply make these decisions just because of money. We cannot simply make these decisions just because we are scared. We have to care, we have to be thoughtful, we have to look at as many perspectives as possible, look as far into the future, have as many plans for the backup plans, for the contingency plan, for the plan to plan, and look at every possibility that we can in order to provide those things that our students, our communities, our country really need. The impact of higher education is so wide and far reaching that if we don't care about all these perspectives, we're gonna make some decisions that will hurt us in ways that we just don't even know and can't see. So we, the, the last thing I can leave is just, thank you all for inviting me to come speak. And, and I, I've learned so much. I have appreciated this opportunity so much. And I thank y'all for what y'all are doing with Dream Launch, but don't forget to care. That we won't know what our decisions make. You know, it's like generations before us made. We won't know what the impact of our decisions we'll make in higher education will be like until two years, three years, four years, five years down the road. As I listen to Brother Kadish talk more and more, I just know right now is that the, the stuff is out there. And I know I've worked with EAB when I lived in Richmond. Um, the stuff is out there to use the data, to use the information. Use your people around you to make informed decisions. There's going to be two or three scenarios you're going to have to play and juggle with. You know, we're going back in the fall, but we're going back earlier because we really? realized, yeah, we've decided to go back earlier. Each campus in, uh, in North Carolina can decide when they start. So we're going to go back earlier for the simple fact we want to be out just in case something else happens uh, from that perspective. And so we also know it's also a financial thing. And I know I keep bringing up money, but that's what will make in echo a lot of decisions. Right. And I hear what my sister said from Odessa. And I'm so everybody know I'm still pro student. But at the end of the day, I am not sitting in that room with the chancellor of the university system where they have to make true financial decisions. And so I say that to say, I hope that diversity, equity, and inclusion is still at the forefront because I'm at Chapel Hill. We got so much drama around it. You know what it is. Um, second, I hope like it is shared strategic plans. By the time you're right, they're on paper. I worked on one for a whole year. And by the time you actually get it on paper, try to implement it, it's too late in some regards. The, the economy and people shift, uh, right? And so you need to, and then there's no metrics to really, nobody ever puts a true metric system to a strategic plan, which I think is interesting, um, to make sure that it's having true impact, not only your students, but the community that you sit in. And so I say all that to say that leaders are gonna make tough decisions. We don't know, some will be right, some will be wrong. But we know that what the face of higher education looks like now in May of 2020 needs to look different from May of 21 and beyond because, again, something else will come. We've all faced other things. As Dr. Sue said, been in this business over 30 years, other things will happen. It is basically 90% of how you react to it and what you're prepared for and putting your teams in scenarios to think about what the future will hold and how you change that. I tell my team, Innovation to be the key. Just like Uber and Facebook interrupted businesses. You know, if you ever read about Christoph Christensen, how businesses come and interrupt certain things, now's the time for us to shake up higher ed and really interrupt what we do, how we offer, and really get to the meat and bones of how we can become better. 
This has been great. I'm going to go ahead and conclude the discussion. Give yourselves one more round of applause or a round of snaps. Uh, Dr. Brewer, if you want to take us out, I think that's all I have. Bukila, Dr. Brewer, anything else? What we Oh, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much. Um, I have definitely learned a lot. I spent about seven years in higher education in um, Northwest Arkansas Community College. So it was great to hear you guys uh, talk about higher education in every level. And I also have a, 11, a, um, a daughter that's in 11th grade that's doing dual credit. So she's in college physics. Okay, typically it's a C class. Well, it's online or remote. What is it? Emergency remote, right? <laughs> so now she has a B. So you know, like, so I'm a little like, hmm. Okay, something's not adding up. So thank you guys so much for joining Dream Lunch. We truly, truly appreciate your time, and we hope that you guys keep in touch with us. I do echo those thoughts. Thanks, Rakila. Thanks, Dee, for moderating and put together an excellent panel. And thank you all for your time. I know that it's hard to carve out time and everyone wants to talk to you and have you on these Zoom sessions all night long and you chose to be with us tonight. So thank you. From the healthcare standpoint, I assure you that we will deal with COVID. Um, it won't go away. We will learn to live with COVID and what that means, I don't know. And I respect all of you and commend all of you for being on the front lines in higher education and trying to make the decisions. They're not, we don't know a lot. I sit on the command center for our institution, which has been fairly privileged because we have direct access to Washington. If you see the Medicare pedigree or the med medical pedigree in Washington, they're all from Indiana. And we just don't know, and it changes every single day what we think about the disease. So I'll leave you with one thing that we just published, agile implementation. Uh, you talked about strategic plans being uh, obsolete, and that's what I've moved to in any complex process that I'm going to change in an institution. It is 60% of the information and go test it. If it doesn't work, regroup and test it again. Uh, we're no longer creating long-term plans. So I don't know how much that is spilling out into education, but it has been a great benefit for us when it comes to implementation as opposed to the lean model. Thank you guys.